Good morning, everybody. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd like to talk to you about uh, work that we've been doing really over the last uh, now a couple of years on using uh, machine learning and uh, uh, neural uh, techniques for uh, improving uh, experience uh, in video conferencing. Um, so just to set the stage uh, for what I'm going to talk about, this is how a traditional video conferencing system looks like at a 10,000 feet level. Uh, so you have a, you know, a sender streaming video to a receiver, um, and you have a, a, a video codec, so a video encoder and decoder pair. Uh, the video encoder basically takes every frame of video at the sender and uh, compresses it into the bits that we're going to send over the network. So these are these encoded video packets that we're transmitting. Um, and uh, this uh, video encoder typically lets you basically set um, a target bitrate that it's going to roughly try to achieve. That uh, This is determined based on essentially a, a feedback loop where you're measuring um, available bandwidth in the network and trying to kind of uh, um, uh, get the video bitrate to match the available bandwidth uh, as closely as possible. Um, so there's kind of an obvious question here. Okay, how much can you actually compress you know, video in today's systems. What, what amount of bandwidth do you need to be able to sustain like a high quality video conference call? Um, so if we take a, um, say a typical uh, setting that we might use today, um, something like 1024 by 1024 resolution. Um, so, you know, today we might even be going higher than this, you know, if you have like 4K uh, uh, video conferencing, but let's, let's stick to something kind of uh, fairly standard at 30 frames per second. And what we're going to do is an, is an experiment where we basically are going to sweep the target bit rate of the video encoder, and we're going to see what is the actual bit rate that it achieves. Um, so that's what's shown here in this top plot. Uh, you're seeing the, in green the achieved bit rate as we basically go from a target bit rate of 1 megabit per second um, all the way down to um, you know, below 100 kilobits per second. Um, and at the bottom, you're seeing um, this metric called LPIPS, which is a perceptual quality metric. So the lower this is, the better the video looks. Um, so what you see here is that when we start reducing the target bit rate, uh, the, the bit rate does go down. But it hits this floor in this case. You know, with this, this is a VP8 encoder, which is a kind of a state-of-the-art encoder. Uh, you see that uh, you can't really go below 550 kilobits per second for this particular video. Um, so video conferencing apps actually will typically recommend at least two to three megabits per second of bandwidth uh, to have uh, an acceptable um, experience. Um, and if we look at, so do we have this much bandwidth in today's networks? In a lot of places we do. And that's why, you know, video conferencing works uh, reasonably well. Um, so this is a map of, you know, global bandwidth. Uh, this is broadband. Um, uh, you know, cellular uh, and, and kind of uh, wireless is a, is a different, uh, you know, game. It's worse than this. But just if you look at, like, uh, broadband, um, in uh, regions like North America and Europe, um, that's the dark, um, you know, colors, uh, we have uh, plenty of uh, bandwidth. But there are a lot of places in the world where even today uh, there's just not um, uh, good enough, you know, um, bandwidth to... Uh, uh, have uh, a high quality video conference uh, um, session. So these are you know, places like Africa, uh, parts of Asia, that um, are essentially kind of left out of the video conferencing ecosystem, the service that we all use um, pretty regularly. Um, now, despite sort of what this bandwidth map will tell you, um, our lived experience kind of suggests that even in the United States, like even on MIT campus, uh, there are a lot of times where we actually end up with um, some poor quality, like disruptions, you know, glitches, audio freezes. Why does this happen even though we actually do have generally pretty good bandwidth? The reason is that, um, and, and let me just get, you know, kind of give you something kind of more quantitative around this. During the pandemic, um, uh, a couple years ago, there was a survey done. This is um, people in the United States, where people ask them, like, what, what is the, your biggest pain point with virtual meetings? And third on this list um, is actually uh, video quality you know, issues, so about 30% of respondents. First on this list is actually audio issues. Um, and I would argue that audio issues are actually video issues in reality, because what's the first thing you do when you have an audio problem? You turn off your video. 
right? So these are also about just the network not being able to sustain you know, that call. Um, uh, and, and so why do these things happen? You know, when we have um, a lot of bandwidth, it seems. Uh, the reason is that when you're thinking about an application like this, which is a real-time you know, application, its performance is really not dictated by the average bandwidth characteristics of your network. Um, so you might have you know, good average bandwidth, but if you have um, what I'm gonna call tail events, where occasionally you have a network you know, issue. Occasionally there's some congestion that happens. Occasionally on your wireless network there's some interference that happens. So even if this is sort of like one second every few minutes that you have this problem, it's actually gonna lead to a pretty bad experience. You know, these frequent disruptions. And, and a lot of it is because the protocols that are running are not good at recovering from even short-term you know, problems. And I'll, I'll explain why a little bit later. So what we wanted to see is, can we actually significantly reduce the minimum bandwidth requirements uh, that we have for video conferencing applications? Um, and we've done a couple of projects in this uh, space. Uh, so uh, one that I'll talk about is the system called Gemino, which is um, an ultra low uh, bit rate uh, neural compression scheme targeted specifically at video conferencing applications. And just a quick shout out to a uh, wonderful set of students and, and, and um, colleagues who collaborated on this project, in particular Vibha Sivarman, who was a lead PhD student and, and, and really deserves a lot of credit for this work. Um, so the core idea behind Gemino is to basically replace these traditional signal processing techniques that now for decades are, are basically the way you know, video compression works with predictive modeling. So if we have models that have an understanding of the visual world, uh, they have a strong prior, and, and so they can reconstruct a lot of things that we don't actually have to send over the network explicitly. Um, that's the big picture, that's the high level idea. In particular in Gemino, um, the sender is going to transmit um, uh, downsampled video to the receiver, uh, and it does a lot of downsampling. So what we're going to send is a very low resolution version of the video over the network. And the receiver is going to use um, a neural decoder that I'll talk about to basically upsample this to a high resolution, a high quality video. Um, so this is a super resolution task, um, but it's a very extreme form of super resolution. So this was kind of my attempt of drawing this somewhat to scale. Um, so we're gonna take you know, 120 by 128 resolution frames coming off the network, um, and we're gonna upsample them, um, say, eight times in each dimension, so to something that looks like that. And if we can actually do that, um, do that well, current um, video codecs are very efficient at transmitting low resolution video. Um, in fact, so efficient that um, you can kind of bring down the bit rates that you would need for this kind of application to about tens of kilobits per second, so comparable to what you have today for audio. And again, if you can sustain audio, we want to be able to sustain video. That's, that's basically the, the goal here. Um, so as I said, this is a super resolution task, and there are a lot of super resolution approaches. These are actually used even in, 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 in traditional codecs. Um, but the issue is that when you try to do super resolution at the scale that I'm talking about, um, you kind of end up with things that look like this today. So uh, you kind of miss a lot of the high frequency uh, content of the frame. So you can see you know, in this uh, upsampled uh, frame, things like the grill you know, on the mic, the details of the hair, these are just things that you just don't see in that tiny, tiny low res version of this, right? So there is no kind of uh, good way with sort of just standard signal processing and interpolation techniques to like reconstruct this. It's just not there. Um, so we want to um, address this problem and get the high frequency kind of details back using uh, machine learning. And, and really the idea that we went after uh, is can we recover this high frequency information from one or a few static reference frames? So the idea is that at the beginning of a um, conferencing session, we basically are going to send to the receiver um, one or a few reference frames at high resolution that show you, you know, what that person looks like on that day, you know, in their environment, and, and so on. Um, but it's, it's, it's just like a fixed, you know, image. 
Um, and the receiver is going to take this and, and, and run some processing on it to extract what I'm going to call high resolution features um, from, from that reference frame. Now, during the stream, um, the sender on every frame, again, it has a target frame that it's trying to send. Uh, so the person is moving, you know, maybe something is appearing in the frame that wasn't in the reference. Things are changing, right? This is the target that we're trying to send. And as I said, it's going to downsample it and it's going to send a, a low res version of it to the receiver. So now the receiver has these two pieces of information it has a low res version of the target frame, and it has this. Um, high resolution reference frame in potentially a different orientation with, with maybe even some missing objects or some things in the frame. Um, and it combines those two. So you can see that this, um, you know, and this is a very high level architecture diagram, you know, here, but there's these two pathways to that neural decoder. There's the pathway that uh, takes the low res um, received frame directly, and then there's this pathway that basically um, comes from the high resolution features in the reference frame. Um, so we do some motion estimation by comparing the um, reference and the target uh, frames. And uh, that tells us, uh, that gives us a warping kind of feel that we use to move the high resolution frames um, into the orientation of the target frame. And, and both of those pieces of information are then used by um, a neural network decoder. It's a, it's a convolutional neural network, fairly standard kind of architecture to, to produce the prediction. So we call this um, um, approach high frequency conditional super resolution because um, in contrast to kind of standard super resolution techniques that would only have that pathway from the low res image to the reconstruction, this has this other pathway that um, gets information from a reference frame in, in, in potentially different orientation. So let me show you what this, um, uh, how this uh, does. So this is just an example. You can kind of see the ground truth video um, way on that side. And you see two different um, uh, encodings of it uh, with VP8 and VP9 at 540 kilobits per second and 172 kilobits per second. And then you see Gemino's reconstruction at 75 kilobits per second. And so, you know, if you compare it to ground truth, you know, it's not going to be perfect. Um, you know, there are still like some, you know, blurriness. Sometimes there's some artifacts, but it's quite, quite good. It's it's on par with what you see with, with these codecs at a much lower bit rate. So quantitatively, across a large number of videos and and experiments, we see that if you want to get the same standard sort of perceptual quality metrics as uh, codecs like VP8 and VP9. Um, you end up with this about two to five x reduction um, in the bitrate that you need, um, and if you uh, sort of uh, don't just focus on these metrics, but say kind of uh, you know how, what does it have to be so that the users would find it acceptable, you could probably go even lower, you know, something like seven to ten x, um, and still have an acceptable quality video. Um, another big advantage of this approach is generally its robustness. Um, so you know this this idea of like using a reference frame um, and and trying to uh, warp it into different poses and orientations that's not a new idea actually what we do there um, parts of that architecture are borrowed from an earlier model called the first order motion model which was proposed a few years ago in the vision community and there's there's been other um, are, you know solutions that essentially have that that type of uh, warping kind of idea but the issue with these warping only approaches is that First, in terms of compression, they're great. They can actually give you better compression than what even Gemino gives you. Because you can, um, all you need is to estimate motion. And you can do that from, you don't need, you know, you don't need actual um, um, video frames to estimate motion. You can do that from, say, key points. You know, if, if I just give you positions of a few um, uh, facial landmarks, like where are the eyes, you know, where are the eyebrows, you know, things like that. You can estimate motion. Um, and, and that's what this first order motion model does. But you can see that um, even though on average actually they do perform pretty well, there's these uh, corner cases where they're going to fail quite badly. So one is if you have like this top row, if you have um, significant motion, significant differences between the reference and the target, then it becomes very hard to actually um, you know, just the basically uh, do this reconstruction through warping. And, and you can see that that fails you know, quite well. But what Gemino is, it's inherently a super resolution approach. So you'd expect that the frame that it constructs is always quite faithful in terms of low frequency detail, like where are things. 
um, to the uh, to the actual target. Um, the other, um, you know, the second row here shows an example where uh, there is something in the target frame that was not in the reference frame. Like the hand here um, is in the target, but it is not in the reference. And again, if you're just doing warping, there is no way to get the hand. So um, the things like the first order motion model will just basically hallucinate it away. You know, it's not there. Um, but again, uh, Jamino doesn't have this kind of problem. Um, the other thing I want to talk about just very quickly is, um, and I won't have time to kind of talk about the optimizations and, and things, but there's a lot you have to do to try to make these models practical in terms of um, the computational requirements. Generally, they're going to be a lot more expensive than um, these traditional um, you know, codecs. Uh, so these are just some uh, inference you know, latency numbers um, on three generations of GPUs. So uh, all the way from a Titan X, which is now a, I think a seven or eight year old uh, GPU architecture, uh, to uh, things that are um, close to state of the art like the um, A100. And you can see if you take the like, first order motion model, um, so at low resolution, at 256 by 256, which is the kind of resolution that a lot of you know, computer vision papers will sort of focus on for just developing these models, things work pretty well. But as you try to go up in resolution, the computational um, uh, time basically explodes. Um, and you know, to get real time, you need 33 milliseconds. That's like the max you can, because so, you need about 30 frames a second. Um, so we had to do a lot of things uh, that I won't go into the details to, to bring down that computation time, both in the design of the architecture and in terms of some um, compute optimizations that you can do after that, like pruning and quantization and stuff like that. Um, so before I end, um, I'll take just a few minutes to tell you briefly about an ongoing um, kind of second project in this space, uh, which is now more targeted at packet loss. So the, the issue is that, um, so you know, on these networks, even if you have um, you know, good bandwidth, um, sometimes you'll have uh, packet drops. They're not even necessarily congestion related. They, you know, they may be because of some policing, you know, rate limiting that your ISP is doing, um, even though they have bandwidth, uh, as, as an example. There's a variety of other reasons, you know, why you might uh, sometimes drop packets. And, and in today's network, so if I lose some packets, um, basically the video freezes until I've been able to recover those packets. Um, Again, if you've ever seen that you were on a call and you just see a freeze and then for, there's nothing happening for like a second or two, and then it comes back and kind of like sometimes it just speeds up and catches back up, that's this. That's your uh, receiver basically freezing until it gets the packets that it's missing. Um, and it's kind of a bit weird, right? Because this is a real-time application. If we lose packets on a frame, ideally we'd like to just be able to continue with the next frame. You know, it doesn't matter, we can just skip a frame. But actually they can't do that. Because the way that video uh, compression works is you're creating these dependencies between frames. So you're compressing a frame against the previous frames. So if you're not able to reconstruct one frame, you basically cannot proceed. You have to reconstruct one frame to move on to the next frame. Um, and this, this creates kind of significant problems for um, recovering from packet loss. Um, so as I said, you have to somehow get those packets back. You can do retransmission. Um, this uh, uh, only works if the sender and receiver are close to each other. Um, uh, you know, if they're more than a few tens of milliseconds apart, retransmission in, in, in a live setting doesn't really work. What most applications do is they use what's called forward error correction, which is just basically a form of coding where you add redundancy to the packets that you're sending. So you send extra packets that are redundant, that have redundant information, so that if some of them are dropped, you can still reconstruct you know, the frame from the remaining ones. Um, the, but the problem is that because on the internet, your packet loss patterns are very bursty, they're unpredictable, it's hard to know exactly how much redundancy to add. Um, so basic applications guess you know, based on some basic features about the, the, the network path, but they often guess wrong. And you're either sending too much redundancy, which is just wasting bandwidth, or you don't have enough, and then you're back to the problem that I talked about. You're not able to reconstruct. Um, so um, in this uh, recent project, we've been working on a, a codec called Reparo that uses generative AI techniques to recover from packet loss. Um, so um, the High level idea is, again, we have a model that basically has um, an understanding of um, how things should look like in video, in, in the visual world. 
So if we're missing some packets, um, we don't uh, just try to, you know, we don't resend them, we don't uh, add redundancy to recover them. We have a machine learning model predict what is the missing information, essentially. Um, and I'll only kind of talk about this at a very high level, but the, the structure of the solution is that we have uh, what's called a token-based encoder. So it takes these video frames and it breaks them up into patches and it assigns a token. It maps each of them to a token um, that is basically mapped uh, to a vector through a learned code book. So this is a general, this is a, an existing architecture. It's not kind of our innovation. Um, we, we take this, uh, so essentially a frame becomes a matrix of tokens. We take these tokens, we spread them into packets, um, and uh, these are the packets that we're going to send over the network. And what's nice is because we're going to, the receiver is going to be tolerant to missing tokens, we can actually do a very simple bit rate control here. So if we're, we need to bring down the bit rate, the sender will just drop some fraction of the tokens in, in, you know, in, in the packets. Um, we take these packets and we send them over the network, and now the receiver basically put the, puts the tokens back in place into the matrix, and you can see now we have this um, matrix that is missing you know, some of the tokens. So before we decode, we have um, uh, a model that will fill in the missing tokens, basically. So it will generate the missing tokens, and I'll talk about it in a second, and then and we take that to do it um, to, to the decoder. So uh, the loss recovery is a transformer model. Um, it's a, what's called a spatial temporal um, transformer that is trained to basically take a sequence of these token matrices. Um, and uh, some of them are missing. You can see all these things that say M. Those are the missing tokens that were masked. Um, and its job is to be able to look at basically the other tokens that are available both in that frame and across a small number of frames and reconstruct, uh, you know, predict what the missing frames are. Um, and again, the way it does this is essentially it's learning, you know, during training, it's learning the structure of video, similar to how if you train a language model to predict, you know, missing words, it learns the structure of language and it can predict uh, how things are missing. Um, so I'll just show you one quick result. So, you know, comparison to sort of a state of the art like uh, FEC scheme, you can see that um, as you increase loss rate, Reparo's perceptual quality is very stable. Um, you know, it degrades very slightly, even at, at very high loss rates. Um, it's able to do this reconstruction, but uh, uh, again, once you sort of surpass like the redundancy level in an FEC scheme, you're, you're, you know, you're out of luck and you're gonna have pretty bad uh, reconstruction. Um, so I will stop there. You know, I talked about these two systems um, that we've been working on. There's a huge amount of uh, work to do, you know, in this space uh, 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 around compute optimization. You know, making these models actually run um, real time still on like a laptop or a phone is quite a challenge. Um, uh, there are things to improve quality through personalization and how to do that efficiently. Um, uh, this is kind of a new type of codec, so uh, a lot of things that we do in networking around um, optimizing streaming protocols, adaptation protocols, uh, there's a chance to revisit those you know, questions here. And then these are, um, yeah, I didn't talk about this and, and it's kind of a, a complicated topic, but these are essentially neural, neural networks that um, based on a prior, uh, they, they synthesize, you know, they, they inpaint what you're supposed to see. Um, so there are going to be times where it's not exactly what was there. You know, something about the gesture, about the facial kind of uh, thing may change. So there's kind of ethical questions like, you know, is that okay? Is, is, uh, uh, when, are, when is this okay? You know, when could this be problematic? Um, and so on. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you.